Okay, so now let's go on to our second problem, which is um, as follows. So let's say again that you have some two points here. And what you want to do is consider uh, for all curves that connect these two points, um, which one has the least surface area when you rotate it around the x-axis. So when you do that, you'll get some curve that looks like uh, this. And you have uh, some surface area, which is like up there. And you want to figure out what is the um, minimum surface area that you can possibly get and what curves generates that. So again, this is another functional where j of y uh, gives you the surface area of the curve when you rotate it at the x-axis and y is just your um, independent function. So um, this problem is more interesting in terms of like figuring out what the functional is. And uh, to do that, one thing that you can think of is like say you zoom in, so you have this little bit, and you can split it up into small uh, thrust terms, which are like if you have a cone, and this is a cone, and then you take this bottom section of the cone, and you um, th this bottom section is called frustum. So when you rotate this around the x-axis, you sort of get a frustum shape down here, and you want to figure out what that uh, surface area is. So the lateral surface area of a frustum. Um, and here you have that the sort of midpoint radius of this is y. And the um, lateral um, length, which is like this length over here, is going to be some ds, which is your little incremental arc length. And so we want to figure out a formula for this surface area out here in terms of the radius of the midpoint, I guess you can call it, um, and the um, length on the edge. So what we can do is we can sort of redraw this, and I'll just draw sort of 2D projection of it. So this is your inner radius R2, and this is your outer radius R1, and then we can say that it has a height here H, and um, it has uh, lateral length s, which is just by the Pythagorean theorem, since this is a right angle, it's this length, which is r1 minus r2 squared plus h squared, but that doesn't really matter at the moment. So the way you can solve for the surface area is, um, I think of it this way. So if you have a cone, you can um, sort of think about cutting the cone down the side and opening it up so that it uh, forms part of a circle. And so that'll look something like that. That is awful. Let's pretend that that is a part of a circle. Ah. There, little pac mini guy. Um, so what we can do is look at this uh, figure, which is the entire cone. So this edge over here is the edge that you cut it up and um, try and figure out what the surface area of the frustum will look like over here. And so you can realize that the frustum will sort of form a smaller figure, which is similar to a larger figure, which looks like that. And so your surface area is just this area in between. Um, so what we can do is you can extend this to be a full cone and call the total length of this guy here um, we'll call this length L, and we'll call this L prime, which is this length, and that'll be um, in uh, this figure. It'll be this length is L, and this length is L prime. So notice that L is the radius of this big circle, and L prime is the radius of this smaller circle. And we can also actually determine this angle theta. And so the angle theta, um, notice that this circumference, or part of the circumference, this arc length, is going to be equal to L theta if theta is measured in radians. But also, based on your original cone over here, it's equal to the base of this cone, which is equal to 2 pi r1. And so what we have is L theta is equal to 2 pi r1. Now, we also don't know exactly what the value of L is, but we can use some similar triangles. 
So if you look at this triangle over here and this big triangle over here, it's pretty obvious since they both have right angles that they are similar. Um, and the bottom one is just a scalar version of the top one. So we can look at this length, which is R1 minus R2, and compare that to the big length R1 and use S and compare that to L. So what we have is S over R1 minus R2 is equal to L over R1. And what that means is L is equal to R1, S over R1 minus R2. Okay, so now we can uh, pretty directly determine the area of this little figure over here. So what we can do is figure out the um, area of the whole arc of the circle, uh, of the big circle, and then subtract off the area of this uh, arc of the smaller circle. So um, pretty standard formula for the area of the big circle is pi is theta l squared over 2 and um that just comes from um like if you haven't seen it before it just comes from the area of the whole circle being pi r squared and then if you take a smaller section of it it's proportional to the angle and so it just ends up being theta l squared over 2 and we'll subtract off the smaller length which is theta l prime squared over 2 and we also don't know l prime but we can actually uh, use similar things with similar triangles to figure out what L prime is. So we can look at this triangle and this big triangle and notice that L prime over R2 is equal to L over R1. And so we have L prime is equal to R2 over R1. So doing some algebra here, this is just theta over 2 times L squared times 1 minus R2 squared over R1 squared. And this we can rewrite as being r1 squared minus r2 squared over r1 squared. So um, now we have formulas for theta and we have a formula for L. So we can just plug those two in directly. So we have, uh, based on this, that theta is equal to 2 pi r1 over L. And so that'll actually cancel out with one of the L's in the numerator. And what we have is then pi r1 l times uh, this quantity r1 squared minus r2 squared over r1 squared and l is equal to r1 s over r1 minus r2 this will be equal to pi r1 times r1 s over r1 minus r2 and i'll factor this into being r1 minus r2 times r1 plus r2 over uh, r1 squared. And so now these two cancel with this guy, this cancels with that, and you get a pretty nice formula of this being just pi s times r1 plus r2. Now um, I said you want to sort of have the midpoint radius because that's what your y will be, or you can sort of take like the average value. And it doesn't really matter if you choose the left point, the right point, because um, since we're sort of considering an infinitesimal um, height, uh, those will pretty much be the same, but it's easier just to think about the midpoint. And so it's pretty easy to see that the length over here, which we can call r, r prime, is equal to r1 plus r2 over 2, which means we can rewrite this as being 2 s times uh, 2 pi s times r prime. <sighs> okay, so now we are going to replace s with ds r prime with y, and then integrate that over our interval. So we have j of y is equal to the integral a to b of uh, 2 pi um, s, which will be ds, and 2 pi y ds. Now, again, ds is just equal to root 1 plus y prime squared dx. And now we can use Beltrami's identity. So notice that this is just some function of y and y prime. So we have that f minus f uh, y prime f sub y prime is equal to some constant, which we do not know at the moment. So we can just plug in these things directly. So we have 2 pi times uh, y root 1 plus y prime squared minus y prime times 2 pi y. And again, uh, here you're considering y to be constant, and you're taking the derivative of that. And so that'll just be, again, y prime over root 1 plus 
y prime squared. And um, here, uh, we notice the same sort of cancellation coming between um, the denominators once we combine these two fractions. So we can divide this by root 1 plus y prime squared, square this. And uh, after the algebra, you'll end up with 2 pi y, because the y prime squareds cancel, and all you end up with is a 1 here. But then these both have the common factor of 2 pi y over root 1 plus y prime squared is equal to some constant c. Now again, you want to isolate the y prime, which makes this sort of a separable equation. So you can change this into 2 pi y is equal to c times root 1 plus y prime squared. And square both sides, so you get 2 pi y squared is equal to c squared times 1 plus y prime squared. Uh, now it looks like it's convenient to sort of define c prime is equal to c squared over, or c prime squared, because we're going to take the square root later, uh, over 4 pi squared. And if we do that, then we end up with y squared is equal to c prime squared plus c prime squared y prime squared. And this, we can isolate y prime and get y prime squared is equal to, uh, let's see, c prime squared minus y squared over c prime squared. And if we divide both sides by this and take the square root, then we end up with c prime squared minus y squared over c prime squared. Uh, that's the other way around. c prime squared over c prime squared minus y squared. Square root of that, y prime is equal to 1. Now again, y prime is equal to dy dx. So we can just multiply this by dy equals dx. And integrate both sides. This is equal to x plus c2. And now we want to try and evaluate this guy. Um, so if we look at this, um, this is another place where you can uh, use the same sort of substitution. That's not right. Okay, yeah. So this is actually supposed to be a minus sign because you move c squared, c prime squared to the other side. So this will be minus that, plus that, and so this denominator will be y prime squared minus c prime squared. Yeah. So this, you can actually use what are called hyperbolic trigonometric functions, and if you have not seen them before, look into them, they are cool. But um, you're going to set y is equal to cosh x, and so just as a short introduction, we have some functions. So cosh x is equal to e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. Cinch x is equal to e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. And we have a couple identities between these two. So you can pretty easily verify that cosh squared x is equal to 1 plus cinch squared x, or in other words, cosh squared x minus 1 is equal to sin squared x. And you can also check that cosh 0 equals 1, sin 0 equals 0, and d dx cosh x equals sin x, and d dx sin x equals cosh x. I don't know if it'll be all these. I know that we'll need this one and this one. But um, these are just some nice properties of uh, hyperbolic plus and hyperbolic sign. So you can try and prove them and see why these are like pretty similar to your normal trigonometric functions. Uh, there are actually a lot more relations between them, but uh, I won't go into that too much right now. Anyway, so if you set y equals cosh x, then you have, as I said, y prime is equal to sin x. And so what that means is dy is sin. Actually, I shouldn't use x, should I? Let's use t. Uh, so equals sin t d t. So let's plug that into here, and we end up with the integral of square root c prime squared. I should put in a c prime everywhere. Uh, c prime squared over 
c prime squared cosh squared t minus c prime squared times uh, c prime cinch t dt. And so now this denominator will just become um, uh, c prime squared cinch squared uh, t because of this identity. So this will just become the integral of squared c prime squared over c prime squared cinch squared t uh, c prime cinch t d t. And so this will pretty much just become 1 over cinch t c prime cinch t dt. So these two will cancel and then you integrate that and we're going to set this equal to x plus c2. So this will just be c prime t uh, equals x plus c2. And so we can um, put this back into this by saying that y uh, t is equal to cosh inverse of y over c prime. And now we have that this means uh, cosh inverse y over c prime. We can divide both sides by c prime, say that that is equal to x plus c2 over c prime. And then you can take the hyperbolic cosine of both sides, multiply it by c prime to finally get your answer of y is equal to c prime uh, cosh of x plus c2 over c prime. And if you want, you can just rewrite c prime as c1. And this sort of shape is known as a catenary. Uh, and it's pretty much, I think, it looks something like this. Um, now, the values for c1 and c2, um, also in the Brachista cone problem, I don't think I said this, but you can't solve them analytically, but you could uh, find a numerical approximation. And um, so a couple of things about this Beltrami identity. Notice that like the algebra here simplified really nicely. However, if we used our um, original Euler-Lagrange equation, then we would have to take the derivative of this with respect to x, which would mean taking the derivative of this guy with respect to x, or like this whole guy, and that involves some product rule, some chain rule, and it would be kind of annoying, and then you would have to simplify that, and then get back to somewhere. And um, last thing is, notice that this c that we didn't know, if you trace it down, it eventually ends up being um, our c1 in our final solution. So we sort of traded off um, having a second order equation to having a first order equation with the one unknown, but that one unknown ends up being like the same unknown we would have gotten if we solved the second order um, differential equation. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I want to say um, about these two problems. And so those are a couple of examples of using uh, calculus variations to solve some simple uh, variational problems.